Hey, what's up, everybody? Well, it's been a while since we've put out some new episodes, and I am happy to say that we've got some new stuff for you. So I'm recording this in my house just outside of New York City on April 17th, 2020. And there's been a lot of craziness in our world as of late, and I know most of us are going through some real pain. Now, some of us may have experienced sickness. Some of us may have lost someone close. A lot of us have felt the negative impacts of COVID-19 on our business or our income. Now, ultimately, it all amounts to us feeling like we have zero control over our lives at this point in time. Now, I, like many of you, have been sheltering in place for about a month, and the one concept that keeps circling in my head is the importance of controlling what can be controlled. And it is that concept that plays heavily in today's conversation with my guest, Nick Heath. Now, I'm not going to say the information we're going to share today will be a cure for our collective issues as a global society, but I do think the concepts that Nick and I discuss represent a critical method to regain some control over our physiological and our psychological state. At a minimum, this will serve as a launching point to a better world considering the weight of stress that we are all currently experiencing. Now, just a little bit about Nick. He is a super kind soul, and he is a very smart guy with a PhD in meteorology. But it's his work in the world of breathing that connected the two of us. In this conversation, Nick and I discuss his early life with type 1 diabetes, his passion for the art and the science of breathing, as well as his recent 100-mile ruck in support of the nonprofit Health and Human Performance Foundation. Now, I think you're going to really get a lot out of this episode. I think it's timely, and I'm glad you're here. So without further delay, this is my conversation with Nick Heath. Hey, Nick. Uh, it's really awesome to meet you. So it's been uh, just a couple of weeks since we started communicating online. I found you because you did some pretty incredible stuff for an organization that I follow pretty closely. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. But I want to thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me today. Yeah, thank you, Craig. Looking forward to it. Yeah, definitely. So look, y- your your website is thebreathingdiabetic.com. And I am really interested. You're, as As we were saying before I hit record here, you're like in the crosshairs of the Venn diagram of all the things that I'm interested in, you know, from the world of diabetes to breath work and breathing practices and mindfulness and wellness and all these different things. And you're kind of right at the center of it. So that's why I'm really excited to have this conversation with you. Um, but before we get into the breathing stuff and, and the mind stuff, uh, I just wanted to learn and have everybody understand who's listening, uh, learn a little bit more about who you are. So why don't you tell us a little bit of a bit about your backstory? Yeah, so uh, I'm currently 33 years old, married with a 14-year-old, 14-month-old daughter. Um, I got diabetes when I was 11, so I uh, started pretty young. I had kind of all the classic symptoms leading up to it of you know having to pee all the time, always being thirsty, and I would even I would get home from from school and chug cokes, regular cokes, so you know the best thing you could possibly do, and. Uh, so um, eventually, I got really sick. My my parents, um, you know, watched every room. My dad actually noticed blood in my throw up and said, "We need to take him to the emergency room." So my parents took me there. Um, they did a bunch of tests, and eventually, I'd, it had been almost an hour. The doctor came and said, "We think you have diabetes." And my without missing a beat, I said, "Well, can I have a diet coke, please?" Because I was just so thirsty and my mouth was so dry and. So they actually, they put me in the back of an ambulance and sent me downtown to a a better hospital, you know, and my mom rode with me in the back. And I remember, and I'm an 11 year old boy at this point saying, asking my mom to kiss me because I wanted her saliva in my mouth. My mouth was so dry. And so that's my, my most vivid uh, memory of of diabetes itself. And then from there, I just kind of, uh, you know, I I felt pretty lucky that it's just diabetes. uh, So after getting diagnosed, uh, oh yeah, sorry. Go ahead. No, it's it's interesting you say you're lucky that it was just diabetes because I hear that so often. And, and you know, being type one myself, I understand what you mean by that. But someone who's not type one necessarily might not understand that, or maybe someone who's not coping with type one very well. So when you said you you just feel lucky, it's just diabetes. It, it might come as a surprise to some people, but I totally get what you mean right there. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it just it could be a lot worse, and it, it, sometimes it takes getting something to realize how much worse it could be. 
Yeah. Um, and so I think in that way, diabetes, I actually, I say this all the time that I think diabetes is the best thing that ever happened to me because it made me way more responsible. Uh, I had to, you know, I'm always thinking ahead, planning, I need glucose tablets, I need insulin, I need test strips, I need this or that. And so from a very young age, I've had to be a lot more responsible. And so that I think it's been, yeah, a, a, a blessing, honestly. Um, so, so it, it, what, what were you like as a kid? Because did that, it, it, were you always that responsible kid? Was it, you know, always, uh, did you always have that mindset or do you think the diabetes is the catalyst for you to start acting that way? Diabetes, definitely the catalyst. I was a, I mean, I wasn't a bad kid really. Um, but I was a huge skateboarder. So all I ever did was skateboard, um, and when I actually got diabetes, I had completely stopped. I went into playing video games. That's all I would do is play video games. I had no energy, you know. So after the diagnosis and getting back on track, I got back into skateboarding. But really, um, it, it, diabetes was the catalyst for that. I, I was just a normal kid, you know. I don't think I was uh, too far on either end of the spectrum of being irresponsible or too responsible. But diabetes definitely was the, the catalyst to get me there. Got you. Now, so you, say, you said you were diagnosed at 11, but what I read in your bio online is that you really didn't start taking care of yourself until later in life. So were you just ignoring the, the diabetes? Did you, was there a denial component to it? What exactly was going on during that period of time? Because that's a long stretch of time to say you didn't take care of yourself. Yeah. And I guess that's a, it might be a little overstatement to say I didn't take care of myself, but I didn't, I just kind of said, okay, I'll take insulin, uh, when I need it, um, my A1Cs were right around eight ish, eight and a half. Um, and I just, I really didn't, I didn't realize I could take better care of myself through deliberate, uh, you know, nutrition and exercise. And then now of course breathing, but, um, it was more of just a diabetes is there. I'm going to live my life. If my sugars go up, if they go down, that's okay. I'll, I'll fix, I'll correct. And that's all there is to it. It wasn't really a, a neglect or, or denial. It was just more like, I'm going to live my life and diabetes is there with me. <laughs> Sounds like a typical teenager. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> kind of a maturity thing. You know? yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so you, you talk, uh, you talked briefly, you just kind of went over the concept of breath work and we're going to talk a lot about that. That's going to be a core of our conversation today, but there was, there was transitions in, in life as you started to describe, you know, starting to be more mindful of what you need to do to take care of yourself and the health and wellness component comes in. How did you kind of transition? How did you find uh, yourself transitioning from um, this A1C area of eights and above to starting to become a little bit more mindful of how you need to take care of yourself. Because for a lot of people, it's, it's hard to, to flip a switch, right? Um, there's, there's, there's not a book, a textbook or, or an article that says, okay, if you're not taking care of yourself, this is the way you do it. And then all of a sudden we do it, right? We're humans. So where was that kind of tipping point for you? Yeah. So the tipping point was actually, it was a book. Uh, so my wife's stepfather gave me a book called the new evolution diet by Art Devaney. He, his son, it was a type one diabetic. And so that's kind of why he gave it to me. Um, and it's kind of, you know, a paleo type book. Um, and, and it goes on that theme, but the idea was that it, it, it did flip that switch. Like I was reading the book and I was like, Oh my gosh, I can control my blood sugars by just avoiding certain foods. Like that never even crossed my, as silly as that sounds at age, I was 20, I think four 25 at the time. And it, it never crossed my mind. Hey, if I just cut out certain foods, my sugars wouldn't spike as much. And, and it was actually, so he left it on the, the, the bed for me with a little note. And I read the first chapter that night as I was going to sleep. And the next day we got Popeye's and Popeye's biscuits were like my favorite thing. And I did not eat one. And I don't think I've eaten bread since, um, because I was just so convinced by what this guy said, I'm way more lax now. I kind of think, you know, everyone's different. I realize every body type is different, D different diets work for anyone. And I don't really consider myself on any kind of diet anymore, but it was that flipping mindset that I can do something about my blood sugars that came from reading that book. You're very lucky, uh, be, because to, to have something like that come into your life, but it's interesting that it took 14 or so years to, mm -hmm. to make that connection between food and blood sugars though. Um, yeah, <laughs> was there, was there a, a point of time where, yes, yeah, so the diet, the, the, the understanding what foods do to your blood sugars, that's one component of, of, of getting better, right. Or actually managing mm -hmm. diabetes much better. Was there a, a, a point where you started to look at your mindset 
as well? That, that came later. So um, reading that book kind of sent me down a spiral of, of self-improvement type things, realizing that, oh, I can also try meditation or I can try other things. And so it took me probably from reading that book and changing my mindset on food, I would say maybe another year before it started really seeping into uh, that, that idea of, okay, if I change how I, my outlook on life, that I do have control over this, that there's a lot of things I could be doing, not just food, not even just exercise, you know, just for well-being in general, um, that I do have more control. And, and yeah, so it, it took probably, I'd say, over that next year from reading that book, uh, I dived into a bunch of di- different other books and uh, podcasts where a huge part of that just because you get a lot of information quickly and, and that kind of sent me on my way. Yeah, it's interesting because you describe a process and I think we're all all in that process and regardless of what stage we are in life or what stage we are in controlling chronic illness, whatever it might be like type one, uh, is that there's that ongoing process and it never stops really. Um, so, you know, one of the things that that I, I read about you also was was kind of your introduction into um, into the world of breath work was Wim Hof. And mm-hmm. you know, he's, he's kind of this amazing, fascinating human being on the other side of the planet from us who has had some very challenging things happen in his own life that led him down this path of, of, um, of, of the breath as being the core of a lot of the things, the incredible things that he does, whether it's swimming under ice and, you know, climbing Mount Kilimanjaro in, in, in boxer <laughs> shorts, whatever it might be. He's a really incredible guy, but so how did you, how did you kind of get linked in? And that's really the kind of the beginning of your breath work pathway, I would, I would think, right? So how did you get linked in with the, with Wim Hof and how'd you get interested in him? Um, I heard him, I think it was either on Tim Ferriss or Joe Rogan's podcast actually. And, and, you know, his charisma, just like you said, he's kind of this like mystical guy. I never even heard of him. And he gets on this podcast, they talk about he swam under ice and he's, climbed you know uh everest in his shorts and you just are like wow and then he has so much charisma and starts just you believe him immediately and you want that energy that he that he gives off and so um i guess because of that that idea of wanting more like we talked about kind of like oh uh, how else can i control my blood sugars how else can i control my mind um I'll, i'll step back one more just because i do think this has a role um so in July of 2015, my sister passed away from cancer. And I think that that really, uh, I wouldn't say it like, it just made me realize life short. And so I was more open to just trying different things, I think. And, um, and, and so when I found Wim Hof and, you know, you hear, uh, it's just like this, it's almost magical the way it's described. And, and so I, I immediately kind of latched onto it and, it must have been December 2016, my wife, or, or just before that, my wife bought me the 10-week online course. I practiced it religiously. I thought, you know, this was, uh, this is all there is to life. You just do the Wim Hof breathing and, and, and life is good. Um, I, so, yeah, that's, that was my introduction to the breath. It, it actually, uh, I got hooked on it through a, a guy named Patrick McCown, but um, we can get into that if you if you want to go farther now or or stop there. But uh, yeah, we're that's gonna, how I started Wim Hof. Yeah, we're going to definitely dive into Patrick's work as well and and your connection to him. I'm just curious with Wim Hof because you know his his philosophies are a little different than than other kind of breathing. Uh, breathing professionals or breathing um, uh, gurus out there, and I hate to use the word guru; that's the wrong word, actually. But experts um, with with Wim Hof, because a lot of people hear of Wim Hof now because he is this big figure and he's he's a super smart guy and he has research that backs up a lot of the stuff that he he talks about. But a lot of his stuff, from my perspective, is kind of more aggressive type breathing, right? And I'm curious to understand, you know, how as a as your were you able to monitor your blood sugars as you were doing Wim Hof stuff? And how did that interact with your blood sugars? Yeah. So that was kind of a, so I, I think the Wim Hof method is great. I, I'll, I'll throw it out there that I do think it's an awesome method, but there are caveats and that's a big one, blood sugars um, and the stress of it. And so if you were to use his method, you know, periodically, I don't think it would be a huge deal. And and of course you want to, I found that it actually raised my blood sugar slightly um, because of that sympathetic response. You know, you're breathing big uh, breaths. Usually it's upper chest just because you're, you don't know really what you're doing. Although he does try to, you know, push you to use your stomach, but you know, you just start breathing 
deep breaths and, and that activates that fight or flight and gets you kind of ramped up, which is kind of the point of it. But over time, I think it ended up doing for me more harm than good just because it became a habit where I'm out at work walking around like, you know, I think oh, I should always be breathing like this. I always need this feeling of, you know, elation of my, you know, of how good it makes you feel right when it's done. Sure. And so I do think that it has its place, but for diabetics specifically, it's, it could be doing more harm than good in that for us, especially yeah. type ones. Yeah, I, I think that's an important point also that you said is that there's, as we we're going to talk about throughout our conversation, there's there's different forms of, of breathing and there's different forms of breath work and they're for very different purposes. And yeah. and look, I was not trained in Wim Hof, so I can't speak uh, to it from a firsthand perspective just from what I've learned about it. It's clearly it's 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 not it's not the uh, the rest and relax type of breath work that that you're looking for to uh, to reduce uh, your stress anxiety. It's yeah. to work on the other end of the spectrum, yeah. and it's neither positive or negative. There's positive for that type of breath or every type of breath work, depending on what you're looking for. So, yeah, exactly. So that that I guess had you start to to explore deeper into the world of of breathing. And after a period of time of doing Wim Hof stuff, how did you come across Patrick's work? Because he's over in, in, on the other side in Europe and his work kind of stemmed from, from, from Russia, uh, from back in the, uh, in some training of, uh, I'll let you tell the story, but it's, there's deep roots in terms of his stuff. But how did you find Patrick and, and, and his oxygen advantage type of work? Yeah, so I heard about him through. Um, so I'd, I'd heard of the oxygen oxygen advantage from a guy named Brian Johnson. He has a, a program called Optimize, and he reviews books and things. And he had read the oxygen advantage and said it was you know the, one of the most life changing things he'd ever done. And I just didn't believe it. I was a Wim Hof guy, you know. I was like, no, you don't breathe less; you breathe more, and you super oxygenate and all these things that you know you you kind of believe and. But when I moved to Florida, um, back to Florida, and I, I realized I was just, I was losing all my energy. And it was exactly what I just told you of that habit of over breathing. Um, if, you know, if I was just using Wim Hof maybe once a day, even, or, or a couple times a week, I'm sure I wouldn't have, have noticed such a dramatic difference. But I was using it a lot and probably just, not even just the method, just it became a habit of just breathing more and probably using my mouth to breathe. And that habit uh, snowballed into some things we can talk about. Probably, I don't know for sure in my own body, but some consequences of over breathing chronically. But in any case, I heard the Bulletproof podcast had Patrick McCown on it. I listened to it and I mean, everything made perfect sense. I was like, oh, he's talking about breathing 24 seven, you know, correct breathing. No, I mean, he, he has techniques, but it's not really a technique. It's a, let's restore our breathing to its physiological levels, what we are supposed to be breathing like. And so that night I bought, um, it was a Sunday, I believe I bought tape. I, I slept with my mouth tape. It came off, but then I felt pretty incredible the next day. And then it must've been two days later that I'd consistently done it, that I had more energy than I'd ever had in my life. And I emailed my wife and I was like, this is, you know, I said something silly, like, this is amazing. It's so simple. And I have so much energy. And, and so from there, um, I started because that has such an impact. Then I said, okay, what else is he teaching? So I got the book, I read it. I started all the other, the other practices of the slow light breathing. Um, and then some of the walking breath holds. And eventually a few months later, I was like, man, my blood sugars have been amazing. It, it just seemed like, wow, I, you know, I was just testing a lot and noticing it. And I, I ended up, <laughs> I wanted to know so bad that I went to Walgreens and bought a, one of those home A1C test kits that you should probably never trust. But I was like, I'll buy it. And it came back 4.8. And this is coming from like, I was around the mid sixes at that point, And I was like, holy smokes. I don't know if that was true or not, but at my next uh, indoor appointment, it came back at like my A1C was 5.4. So almost a percentage decrease just from adding this breathing. And that's so, amazing. yeah, yeah. So it, it blew my mind. And that's why now I've kind of dedicated my whole life to trying to, to get it out there. Yeah, no, that's, that's amazing. And we're going to talk a little bit about the research because there is some research that shows percentage drops in HbA1Cs as a result of just incorporating breath work, uh, certain types of breath work. 
Um, so yeah, let's, let's dive into that a little bit because you were talking about, um, taping your mouth and, and for somebody out there who doesn't understand what that means, maybe you can clarify a little bit. Yeah. So, uh, the mouth tape is essentially a, a gentle paper tape and you can just basically put it across your lips horizontally or vertically, if, you know, if, if that makes you just right in the middle and it's just to prevent your mouth from opening at night. There's several companies now that do this. There's, um, there's one actually for another type one diabetes shout out um, lip seal tape which i think they just changed their name to some simply breathe but if you go to lipsealtape.com um her uh the guy who invented that he's i think he's an orthodontist his daughter is a type 1 diabetic um so another diabetes connection there but there's also somnifix i think that one was on shark tank um and then patrick uh, mccown has myo tape and so the idea is just to tape your mouth so you, so that you uh, breathe through your nose at night Yes, yeah, it's, it's to train yourself so you're not uh, wide open at, at night. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. It's interesting. So uh, I started um, I started in the world of breathing. Uh, I've been breathing my whole life, clearly, but the specific <laughs> breathing that we're talking about here for about a year or so ago, um, after years of doing meditation, and just as you're saying, and just anecdotally, I use I don't know if you use a CGM, but I use a Dexcom. And we, just before we kind of dialed in here, we were recording, I was showing you my Dexcom numbers because, especially because I'm stuck at home like everybody else on the planet right now because of what's going on with coronavirus, I have more time to, to dedicate to my breathing. And I'm, I have sessions in the morning, sessions in the evening. And what I'm seeing is my blood sugars are so much flatter. And it's not like I've changed anything else. Now, granted, there's other variables that we have to consider. I'm not commuting to to work every day. I'm not dealing with the stressors of the day to day, but just by making sure that I'm consistent with my breathing, I'm seeing those significant decreases in my blood sugars and the the spikes are not as dramatic as they used to be. So I'm really curious to see how this is going to translate into the real world once we get back out of quarantine um, <laughs> and, and all the normal stressors are back in. But there's a as you, as we were talking about, we'll talk about in a second. There's there's a lot of research around that. So really exciting stuff that something so simple can make such a dramatic impact on your life. Um, so let's talk about the, the the different components of oxygen oxygen advantage. So you're actually a trained coach, and this is not a, an ad for oxygen advantage <laughs> whatsoever. Um, and it's not to say that there's not other methods out there, but a lot of methods out there are based on Patrick McCown's mm -hmm. work as well. Um, but let's dive into some, some key aspects, um, that you might be able to share with us. So we, you talked about this concept of over breathing. Um, one, what does that mean? Because that's at the core of, of oxygen advantage. What does it mean? And why is it so important for us to be conscious of this concept of over breathing? Yeah. So simply over breathing is just breathing more than you need at a given time. Metabolically, what does your body require? And if you're breathing more than that, then what your metabolic requirements are, you're over breathing. And that can, and, and the thing about that and that why that's such an important definition is because it can be very subtle. It doesn't have to be the big breaths. It doesn't even necessarily have to be mouth breathing, although it typically is associated with mouth breathing, but it's just simply breathing more than you need at any given time. And it, it's so small, but it can have a, a big impact long term, especially if you're chronically doing this. So the biggest thing, uh, and this is what the oxygen advantage stresses and, and what most breathing techniques and back, you know, to the ancient yogis uh, stress is retaining more carbon dioxide. So typically when we think about breathing, we breathe in oxygen and we breathe out carbon dioxide. And that's kind of, no one really, you know, questions that it's a waste product, you know, but carbon dioxide actually has a lot of really important physiological roles in our body. And one of them is for breathing and specifically getting the oxygen from the red blood cell into your, into your tissues and cells. So I actually, I think, and since you're a type one diabetic and since a lot of your listeners are, an analogy I like to think of is that, you know, we can eat all the sugar we want. We could eat all the sugar. But if we don't take insulin, that can then, you know, be the catalyst to take that sugar from our blood into our cells, it becomes toxic and builds up. Similarly, not exactly, but um, carbon dioxide plays that same role as insulin. So you can breathe all the air you want, but the goal is to get it from that red blood cell into your tissues. And carbon dioxide helps do that. And it's something called the Bohr effect. And so as counterintuitive as it is, by breathing less, you get more oxygen. And, and that's kind of at the root of the oxygen advantage, which, 
And then the predecessor to that was the Buteco method, which is who Patrick studied under. Gotcha. Appreciate that. So, so you also talked a little bit about mouth taping and we talked about different, uh, different products that might be out there to help us. And why is it so important to breathe through our noses? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So the nose in general is just uh, an amazing uh, it's just it, it, it does so many things for our breath that I think get overlooked because it's so simple. Again, like we just said a few minutes ago, it's just it's so simple yet so profound. And um, so the first thing we and we probably all are familiar with this, it, it warms and humidifies the air you breathe. So it conditions the air so that when it gets into the lungs, it's, it's ready for oxygen transfer. And a good um, analogy from this comes from a book, um, Restoring Prana from uh it, anyways, she, she makes a really good analogy of when you it, when it's cold outside and you get chapped lips, you know, you immediately feel that inflammation and you know, oh, I need you put on some chapstick or whatever. But when you're breathing through your mouth, that same thing is happening in your airways in your lungs. You're getting this colder, drier air. And think about your lips getting chapped. Think about that happening in your in your airways and lungs, and that can cause inflammation and lead to issues with uh, oxygen absorption and, and gas transfer in in the lungs themselves. Another huge benefit of the nose is nitric oxide. So in the paranasal sinuses, uh, nitric oxide is continuous re continuously released. So for each breath you take, you're bringing nitric oxide down into your lungs. And nitric oxide is a potent vasodilator. So some things it does is it redistributes the blood flow. So if you think we're, we're sitting upright right now or standing, um, gravity would tend to, to push our blood near the base of our lungs. But what, what studies have shown is that nitric oxide actually re redistributes that blood flow so that there's a better matching of air and blood flow, meaning more better, ga more efficient gas transfer. And one paper I read even, even said that made the argument that nasal nitric oxide might be an adaptation that allowed us to be upright, be bip bipedal because of the, the compensation for gravity. Uh, nasal nitric oxide also sterilizes the incoming air. It's, it's been known as an antiviral and antimicrobial, which is getting a lot of attention right now with the whole coronavirus. Yep. And then it also enhances the functioning of the cilia. So this, the cilia are these little hairs in your airways and your lungs. And uh, when particles and pathogens get trapped in the mucus, these cilia beat really fast to push it back out through your airways or you cough it up and nitric oxide enhances their function. So uh, nasal nitric oxide is a huge benefit of breathing through your nose, the warming and conditioning. And then the last thing I, I guess I, I should definitely mention is the, the mind connection. So when you breathe through your nose, it, it activates region of the old, regions of the olfactory bulb, which is typically thought of the region for smelling. But they've done studies where they give you give odorless air and it lights up these regions of the olfactory bulb. And the reason that's important is because the olfactory bulb can speak with the amygdala, um, which is just basically the part of the brain that can control a lot of the emotions. Mm -hmm. And so nasal breathing is going to help activate that. And, and it kind of it ties together why there's so many benefits of breathing when you start to realize that. It's enhancing gas exchange, it's, it, which is going to help oxygenate your body better, but it's also impacting your brain. There's been studies that show it helps with memory, a, a whole host of things. So uh, I've kind of thrown a lot out there, but it's, it's, it's really the, the easiest change you can make. If you do nothing else, just breathe through your nose 24-7. Yeah, it's, it, there's a lot of information there, but it's all super important information. And I, I can, you can always uh, guess that someone out there is going to say, well, I have allergies, I have sinus issues, et cetera. And we're not going to dive into that necessarily, but I have significant allergies. I also had sinus issues, deviated septum, all these different things. And I can say just from starting to breathe through my nose and be more conscious of it over the past year or so, it's made a tremendous difference in terms of the amount of air I can get through my nose. Um, so it's like, it's kind of that you use it or lose it type of a thing, I guess. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's definitely helped by, by forcing myself. And I find myself with my mouth shut most of the day now, um, with the exception of, of significant exercise where I really have to breathe to kind of recalibrate and get some air in quickly. But that's a whole other discussion that we'll have at some other point. Yeah. Um, so we talked about, uh, over breathing. We talked about the importance of, uh, breathing through our noses and, and nitric oxide, um, Another component of the system is the diaphragm, which you touched a little bit before when we breathe through our mouths, we're breathing with our chest and we're doing this kind of vertical breathing, a lot of us do. 
Um, what's the importance of breathing with our diaphragm? Well, yeah, our diaphragm is our breathing muscle. Uh, so it's kind of there to facilitate deeper air. So when you breathe with your diaphragm, you're going to bring air in deeper into the lungs. So that's the first thing to think about is that what we were talking about with uh, the blood closer to the base of the lungs and nitric oxide helps redistribute that. But also by breathing through your diaphragm, you're going to help bring that air deeper in. Um, and, and that will also help with core stability. Um, I'm not, uh, so I'm not the expert on, on diaphragmatic uh, for, for core stability and other aspects, but there are uh, great books on it that like um, that restoring prana, that one has a, a, a whole chapter on the importance of the diaphragm and how it, it helps with core stabilization. And, and by working it out, and with this diaphragmatic breathing, you're going to eventually make your breathing a lot more efficient. So it's going to help with, so when you breathe, a portion of that oxygen goes into the breathing muscles themselves. And so the more you use it and work it out, the more efficient it'll become, the stronger it'll become. And therefore you can, you, you can utilize less oxygen for the breathing muscles and, and send it to other places. But yeah, the, the diaphragm is, is a important muscle and something that we can easily work out with, uh, with just nasal breathing itself. It, it, it naturally activates the diaphragm. Uh, so that's a quick way to just start with just nasal breathing. Is there a way for someone out there to understand if they're actually breathing with the diaphragm? So uh, I, I have certain exercises that I've done, but is there a way, a quick way for someone to understand if they're using the diaphragm versus not using the diaphragm to breathe? Yeah. The easiest, quickest way is just to simply place one hand on your chest one hand, you know, just above your navel or above your belly button or on your belly button. And just, if you can, it's hard because the minute you do that, you start changing how you breathe, but just observe whether it's your hand on your chest going up and down, or if it's the hand on your stomach going up or down. And that's kind of the easy, quick way without having to get uh, too technical with, with how the diaphragm, uh, you know, proper activation and things, but that's the best way. And, um, and that's an easy thing to practice. For example, you can lay on your back um, and put your hands on your on your chest and stomach and just try to make the hand on your stomach move. You can even place a, a book on your stomach and then that would, you know, watch how much it goes up and down and, and try to focus on that. So that's the, the fast way to do it. That's great. You know, it's interesting because the, the more you talk about breathing and the, 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 the mind connection, what I've found is that... Um, it just from my personal experiences that it's actually put me more in touch with, with, uh, uh, uh being aware of different parts of my body. Right. It's, it's like, you're, you're aware that there's proprioception. There's, I wasn't aware of my, I wasn't breathing with my diaphragm. I wasn't aware that my, my ribs should pop out in a certain way when I breathe correctly. And by actually putting your hands on yourself as you're doing these exercises, it kind of develops that other part of your brain as well. So it's not just the breathing mechanism, but you become more aware and then ultimately you uh, dive into, in many cases, that kind of relaxation response that we're going for in many cases when it comes to uh, reducing blood sugars and uh, stress and anxiety, going more parasympathetic. A um, couple of other topics that I wanted to touch on, uh, because, and this kind of goes along with what I just said, there's some research uh, around inhale to exhale ratios. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and that's, that is actually, that's a really good question. So I've read both sides of the story, um, the equal inhale, equal exhale. Uh, I've seen studies that show that that will maximize heart rate variability, but I've also seen that when you do a slightly longer exhale, you get a slightly more parasymp parasympathetic response, which is going to be that more relaxation. And I actually uh, read a paper recently. They, they compared um, an equal uh, so it was a five second inhale, five second exhale, or a three second inhale, seven second exhale. And they, they essentially concluded that the, both of them were, were almost equally effective from a statistical significance standpoint. And so they, they actually put in there, you know, do whatever is comfortable. And that's kind of what I've always said to people I, I work with, or that I just, you know, family members, people I talk with is start with something that's comfortable. Personally, I, I like the extended exhale. So I'm, I'm more of like a, if I do six breaths per minute, I'll do a four second inhale or a second in a six second exhale. Um, if I go slower, um, I might do like an eight, eight second inhale and then a 12 second exhale. And so I like that more relaxation response. And uh, so, so that's kind of where I fall on it, but either one is good. So it's kind of just finding what feels right for you. 
Sure. Yeah. I appreciate that. There's, there's, there was some stuff I read a bunch of years ago about the, uh, the ratio of one to two and that was ideal. And I guess, as you said, it, you don't want people to think about it too much. You just want them to be more in, in their, their body, uh, versus counting, uh, and saying, Oh, I didn't quite get the one to two ratio. It, it, I guess it's just whatever's comfortable for you. Yeah. I, I found with that, uh, the comfort level too, is using a breathing app can save you a lot of trouble with counting and, and you pick, you know, you pick what, if you want that extended exhale or you want the equal and it, you can't mess up, you know, that the app tells you when to inhale and when to exhale. You just have to be careful of over breathing again, going back to some of the things we said, but that's an easy way to, to mitigate some of the counting issues. What are some of the, there's a couple of apps that I've used. So I've used, uh, Brian McKenzie has his, his uh, shift the state app, right. Mm-hmm. Which I, I found good. Some of the, the, they're, they're, they're short for me. I wish I can get them a little longer on there. Uh, I've used the XBT app as well for some of the, some breathing exercises. Is there something that you use specifically to help you? Yeah. The, the two I use, and it's because of that, that same issues, I want to be able be in full control. Cause I like to kind of tweak, try a longer exhale, try shorter, but I use, I breathe. So it's really simple. It's just, uh, and, and that one's free and you just have a slider bar. You tell it what inhale, what hold, what exhale, what hold. And then there's also one called breathing zone, which lets you set breaths per minute. So you can't control um, two. You don't have quite as much control, but you can say breathe at five breaths per minute and do the one to two ratio, like you said, or do an equal inhale to exhale. And then they also have a feature that will start equal. And then as you do the breathing session, the exhales get longer and longer until you hit that one to two ratio. And that one, I kind of like that one sometimes just because it's so relaxing to start equal and then slowly extend the exhale. But yeah, breathing zone and I breathe are the two I use. I think breathing zone costs money now. When I got it, it didn't. But um, yeah, I don't have any association with any of these apps. I just find them and try them. Yeah, and we're not we're not necessarily uh, promoting any of these apps no. it's purely for educational purposes right now. So, I, I, what is what does your breathing practice look like? You know, you're doing this professionally, so it's in it's in your day all day long, I would assume. But what does your personal breathing practice look like? Yeah, that's that's funny you say that because that that's the good and bad of breathing is that we're always doing it, and so once you start noticing it, sometimes it's hard to turn it off, and that can get frustrating. You have to really be focusing to not notice your breath. But, um, so I, I'm pretty structured with mine. I start every morning with, um, I do 11 minutes of slow breathing. And then around now that I'm working from home, it's a little different because I have a little more flexibility just like you. So then, uh, mid morning or or just before lunch, I do seven minutes of slow breathing. And then before bed, I do seven minutes of slow breathing. Those numbers are just my favorite number is 11 and my wife's favorite number is seven. So I do 11, seven, seven, um, after in the morning, after my, my slow breathing, I do a series of breath holds. So I do three or four or five walking breath holds. And then I do a, a little bit more intense, I guess, breath hold at the very end. And then I end that. So I end that by putting on the the silly uh, breathing mask from the Oxygen Advantage and look like you know Bane from Batman. Sure. And I do just one uh, round of squats, push ups, and plank just to get a little exercise with the, with the added carbon dioxide. Sure. So and then now that I'm from home, live working from home, I, I do sprints in the afternoon um, around lunchtime. I, I go out and do about five or six sprints while holding my breath. <laughs> And, uh, that one, that's really awesome. Cause with the whole rucking and all the things I was doing, I was super slow, just endurance. And I lost all of my fast twitch, you know, I guess uh, bursting power. And so doing sprints with breath holds has been awesome. So is that leading into the area of hypoxia right now? Yeah. Yeah. So I, yeah. Yeah, so maybe we I, could talk a little bit about that because the concept of being hypoxic sounds negative. Lack of oxygen sounds negative, but in many cases, it's not necessarily negative. So maybe you can kind of touch upon hypoxia and what are some of the benefits of that and some of the hypoxic training that you do. Yeah. So, and, and that's especially important to bring up for diabetics because at the root of most of our complications is tissue hypoxia. And that's, you know, when it comes down to blood flow, all of that stuff, it comes down to not getting enough oxygen to, to your organs and to your tissues. And so when you say, oh, you're a diabetic doing intermittent hypoxia, that seems kind of counterintuitive, but it, it turns out that it's, it's a matter of dose. So 
if you go severe hypoxia, it can have very negative consequences. But if you keep it within a reasonable limits and for people, uh, you know, as a coach and helping people, I always suggest wearing a pulse oximeter just so that you monitor it. If you do drop too low, you know, next time not to go, go so strong with the breath holds. But the idea is that by dropping your oxygen saturation and the, the limits are somewhere around like 82 to 95% kind of gets you in, into the therapeutic range from one review study I saw that was published back in like 2014. There might be newer things, but that one kind of did a full review. And that's, that's where I saw about 82 to 94% or 95% uh, SpO2 gets you in that therapeutic range. And it does a lot of cool stuff. So it, it increases your red blood cell. So your spleen releases red bl- additional red blood cells. So that increases your oxygen carrying capacity. So on the back end of the breath hold, you're going to increase how much oxygen is being delivered because you're increasing your red blood cell. Um, it has a lot of uh, immune positive immunity effects. And so that's a big issue is, is that it releases a lot of um, natural uh, 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 immune I guess, uh, modulators, I guess is a good word, but, um, and I think that's a big, so there've been studies that shown just intermittent hypoxia wearing a mask where they can control the people's, uh, oxygen level significantly increase, increase their immunity. And I think that might be a big part of why the Wim Hof method gets so much, uh, praise for its immuno side of things is because yep. when you drop your oxygen saturation it has a lot of immune benefits and it's a compensor you know your body's compensating for that lack of lack of oxygen um the last thing i'll say about breath holds in particular is it, it's really good for focus um if you when you hold your breath you forget everything else that you're thinking about all you think about is, is breathing right and so even just before this podcast i did a few breath holds just to kind of like focus my mind and not be thinking about anything else. And there have been studies for intermittent hypoxia, not the exact same as breath holds, but a uh, similar concept that have shown it can increase brain blood flow pretty significantly. So it makes sense. You know, you, you lose oxygen, your brain is your body's first, you know, that's what it's going to protect first. So it, it, you know, rushes blood to your brain. And so you feel kind of a, a deep state of focus right afterward. Yeah, those are awesome points right there. It's interesting that you bring that up because I wrote an article about a week or two ago about uh, positive uh, effects of bre- of breathing protocols as it relates to building resilience. And one of the things that I've found, especially during some of the, the breath hold techniques that I've been doing, is that that's a great point. As you said, it makes you more mindful and kind of, kind of puts you in touch with who you are and your body at that point. But it really helps you understand what you're made of because you 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 feel like you're starving for air when you're really not starving for air. And that self talk that has to occur as you're going through these techniques and you're building your your breath hold uh, capabilities over time, it's building that mental resilience because you don't you don't want to give up necessarily. You, you you don't give up and you keep going. And then over time, you just kind of get more comfortable as your boundaries start to expand more and more. So I think it's really interesting what you said there with the, the mindful component of it. Yeah, I would say breath holds is a a quick way to build resiliency because just like you said, you can, when it starts hurting really bad, you can physically tell yourself, or if you have someone kind of coaching you, like relax and like, you can relax your body even when it hurts. And then you're like, Oh wait, I can go a little longer. And, and like you said too, it's not necessarily oxygen, it's carbon dioxide that's making you want to breathe. And so even just that shift in mindset of, I'm not actually really low on oxygen. I'm just not tolerant of carbon dioxide as an athlete or, you know, athletes and stuff can, that can mentally push them like, Oh, well I can never, you know, I can never come that. But so yeah, it did, it definitely helps build resiliency and helps keep you calm when your body's most important function, you know, breathing, you want to do it and you, you force yourself to kind of hold it a little longer. It definitely helps build your, your mental strength. And it's interesting how something like, like breathing just translates into how we function in the real world. Right. It's like if you can build up your, your mindset as you're doing those techniques, when you encounter something stressful in the real world, you're physiologically going to and emotionally act very differently than if you were not training yourself on a day-to-day basis That's like right. that. So it has so many other benefits than all of the things that you're detailing, all the wonderful benefits you're detailing, not only for type ones, but also for anybody else who might be quote unquote healthy as a baseline um, and, and building up our mental resilience too. You're, you're very much into, into the research aspect of this. And this is what I really, really appreciate about, about you is that, 
and I'm going to direct everybody to your website and I'll, I'll make sure I link it in the show notes, but it's the breathing diabetic.com. We're going to make sure all of your social stuff is linked up as well, but you have this wonderful, um, and I know that you're a PhD also. So I know that there's a, there's a, there's a scientific component to your background. So on your website, you look at research studies as it relates to breathing as it relates not only to type one diabetes and diabetes as a whole, but you're really breaking it down. And that's, what's guiding you in terms of the things that you're talking about today. So maybe you can pick one or two key research studies that you think everybody needs to know about. And then again, we'll, I'll direct everybody to your website because you have summaries. It's kind of like the cliff's notes for, for research in this area. So maybe there's one or two areas that you'd like to point pinpoint for us. Yeah, great. Um, so there's a, a researcher named uh, Bernardi. That's his last name, Bernardi. If you Google Bernardi slow breathing, there'll be hundreds of papers. And he's done a lot, not only for slow breathing, but for diabetes also. And so one of his papers, um, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but it was published in 2017 in Nature. So Nature is a, uh, a, a very prestigious magazine. So anytime or journal, anytime a paper is published in, in Nature, you're kind of like, okay, it's gone through rigorous peer review. And we, we can, you know, accept it as credible. But this was 2017. And what they found is that in type 1 diabetics, slow breathing was able to enhance arterial function. It was able to increase autonomic balance. So um, some of the measures they use is something called the barrel reflex sensitivity. And basically what that is, is your body's ability to quickly adapt blood pressure given to given circumstances. So keep your blood pressure in, in check. And in diabetics, that's an early indicator of autonomic dysfunction. And so they were showing that with slow breathing at six breaths per minute, diabetics were able to push their bare reflex sensitivity up to the levels of, of quote unquote, normal people. Um, and, and so that was a, a pretty amazing study. And, and actually in the abstract at the end, it says slow breathing could be a simple beneficial intervention in diabetes. And to be in nature, seeing that as you mentioned, I do. I, I am a researcher by my degree is in meteorology. I'm a research meteorologist by training. But to see, sometimes I think I'm a little crazy, right? I'm like, I'm doing all this breathing. What is breathing? It seems so simple. And and to see that published in Nature really gave me like, okay, this is really. It's just so simple that it gets overlooked. And so that paper I think is really important for diabetes because it just shows how critical slow breathing can be. And, and I think um, just real quick on that paper, the whole thing with slow breathing is that this isn't like a, a cure all. We're not saying replace insulin or replace the, you know, it's just, it can be added to anything. You're low carb, you're high carb, you exercise, you don't exercise type one, type two. There's no side effects of slow breathing. And it has all these amazing benefits of increasing arterial function, our cre increasing heart rate variability, increasing autonomic functioning and, and resiliency overall is, is really what it comes down to. So why not add it in? Um, another well, lines, before, yeah. before I let you jump into the next study, have you ever read the relaxation response Herbert Benson's book? I have not read the book. No, I've you read have a, to do that. Yeah, yeah, it's that, on my list. Yeah, that that but it's 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 uh it's great because it, it's Herbert Benson, cardiologist, Harvard, back in the 1970s, released the relaxation response, which was really the first oh. book piece of literature that talked about uh, mindfulness meditation. Uh, oh relaxation response, the exact opposite of fight or flight or freeze response, but it's at the basis of a lot of the things you're talking about. So I, I think that that would be an awesome book. I'm going to put that uh, in the show notes as well for anybody who's interested, but that served as a foundation for a lot of my thinking. I read that a bunch of years ago also, and uh, that changed my mindset about stress. Um, and look, stress can be good in some cases, uh, but when it comes to blood sugars, it's not good at yeah. all. So I'm sorry, go ahead. You had a second study that you oh, yeah. highlight for us. But yeah, that's a really good point is that for, for us as diabetics, we really need to keep that in mind that we're, we're already stressed. Our blood sugars go up and down. So things like Wim Hof or anything that's going to really stress your body, it, it does have its use. But keep in mind that parasympathetic, we want that rest and digest, that relaxation response. And I have seen that book cited actually in, in papers. So I, I've heard a lot about it, just never read it. Um, the other paper I was going to mention is one published in 2016. And this one talked about breathing and exercise. But why I think it's important is that it, it, was, it was looking at the integration of the cardiovascular system and the respiratory system in diabetes. And it was kind of this review study, which are kind of my favorite ones because they bring together all of the literature and, and tell you 
what, what are the commonalities here? And one thing that they mentioned that I think is really just something to think about as diabetics is that some of the things we take for damage. So for example, uh, nerve damage, you know, there's tests to see, Oh, diabetic. Oh, you have diabetic nerve damage. Well, what they found is that might actually be autonomic dysfunction. And there's a huge difference between damage and dysfunction because damage implies, right? The damage is done. Whereas dysfunction means, can we make it functional? And they, they argued yes. And so through slow breathing and exercising, a lot of the markers that we associate with damage can actually be reversed. And those are things like the barrel reflex sensitivity and heart rate variability and arterial function by just slow breathing. It's so simple or exercise. And so, um, so I think that's a really interesting paper and I guess we can link to it if anyone's interested. And, and I also, you know, like you said, I write little summaries uh, for my own purpose because I'm, <laughs> I need it to be in common language, but also for, for people that are interested to not have to go through all the jargon. Um, and so that, that one really interested me. That's a really positive thing right there. Exactly. That, that there's, it's not, it's not a, a, a dead end road. Basically we have the ability to, that there's something else in our toolbox that allows us to have some control over something you know, it's, what's really interesting to me, and I'm a healthcare provider, and I try really hard to look at things from a 360 and not just in a silo. Um, unfortunately, our, our healthcare system is very siloed, and I think it's becoming a little less so as time goes forward. But why are, phys- are endocrinologists not talking to us about something that is so simple that costs nothing, just an, an investment in, in, in mindset and, and energy and time that has such profound in, in insight and so such profound outcomes that has documented evidence in journals such as nature. It makes no sense to me whatsoever. Yeah, me neither. And honestly, that's why I feel it's my life's purpose to try to get this out. I'll talk to anyone about it and do anything I can to, to get this information out just because it is so simple. It's just like, yeah, I, I'm not sure. I guess maybe it is the simplicity. And it also is that like when you're a, so I'm a, I'm a, I have a PhD in meteorology, right? If someone told me they were going to read the farmer's, al- farmer's Almanac, I would tell them they're crazy, you know? And maybe there's something to it, I don't know. But, you know, from my education, that makes no sense. So if you're an endocrinologist, you might say, well, you know, breathing has nothing to do with the pancreas and the endocrine system. And what are you talking about? And so, you know, it, it just take a little bit more, I guess, uh, pushing. And, and they, you know, they're so overworked. They have no time. No and, and so they don't have to, you know they don't have the, the luxury of reading all the papers and trying to bring in different fields and integrating COPD with diabetes and asthma and oh, all these commonalities. They have to kind of focus on just their little niche, get their patients the medications they need and send them on their way. So I don't blame them, but yeah, I feel like with, with, with the internet now, I feel like we can ourselves make a difference by just talking about it. And again, no negative side effects, no, and science, science backed. So, yeah, I think that's part of the thing also. It's not a knock on endocrinologist yeah, whatsoever. Yeah. It's, it's the reality is that it's, it's kind of that concept of, you know, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear also is that most people are not willing to accept something like this. The concept of mindfulness and breath work and breathing techniques, it's, it's still somewhat on the outskirts of the healthcare system and people's mindset. So uh, it's not like a, and I have this on a day-to-day basis with some of my patients who are dealing with, with stress-related issues. For me to talk to them, and I try as much as possible to talk about breathing with them, most people don't want to hear it at this point. They want to fix, they want their medication, they want to get better right away. So, um, so I can definitely appreciate that. One, one other point that I do want to talk about before I, um, and I have so many questions for you, I'm sorry, but this is, this no, is a an awesome, interesting topic for me. So, so there's this, look, sleep is very, very important. You talked a little bit about, um, uh, you know, make, making sure that your mouth is closed when you sleep, et cetera. But what is the, the, the breathing sleep blood sugar connection? Okay. Yeah. So the, the first thing I guess to bring up for, for diabetics specifically is that going back to what we mentioned about the parasympathetic and the sympathetic activation. So uh, I saw one study that showed that basically diabetics don't have their, their circadian rhythm like they should. You know, we don't switch into that deep parasympathetic at night as much as, say, uh, a, a normal, again, a quote unquote normal person. And I think we all know that when we wake up in the middle of the night low, how, you know, you, you shot up, that's a huge sympathetic response. There's just a lot of reasons for this. And so slow breathing. Uh, so by just taping your mouth, you're going to first off, slow down your breathing a little bit, which is going to help you go into that 
relaxation response, we can call it, or the more the parasympathetic shift. So for us particularly, that's one thing I found really interesting is that idea of shifting us into that parasympathetic state. But for just breathing in general, the, the nose is so important at night. So um, there's receptors in your nose that if you numb them, uh, it, it basically you, your breathing becomes disrupted because those receptors maintain proper rhythm of breathing at night. And then mouth breathing at night can really enhance obstructive sleep apnea. So going back to that uh, chap lips analogy, you get inflammation in your upper airways. It's going to cause airway resistance, which can then lead to even collapse, which is obstructive sleep apnea or, or, or one cause of it. And so studies have shown that nasal breathing versus mouth breathing, uh, nasal breathing significantly reduces upper airway resistance. So your, your breathing is going to be easier, more rhythmic. And then I actually read one study that showed they actually took, I think it was two patients. They had to, they, they took them off of it because it was, my, my dog is crying. Sorry. Um, uh, they had to, they had to actually take them out of the study or, or stop their portion of it because when they clamped their nose at night and made them breathe through their mouth, their obstructive sleep apnea got so bad that they, it felt, they felt unethical uh, sure. continuing. So it, so yeah, basically your nose is going to help maintain that rhythmic breathing. It's going to keep your airways open and it's going to allow a deeper sleep because of that parasympathetic. And anecdotally, um, that, you know, people that are wearing these aura rings now, which is really awesome that, you know, a lot of them that read Patrick's book, uh, the oxygen advantage, and then they take their mouth. They like, Oh, my deep sleep really, uh, really increased and this and that. And so, I think there's tons of studies now showing that, you know, you miss one night of sleep or you only sleep six hours and your insulin resistance skyrockets, right? You're releasing way more cortisol. That's, that's insulin resistance. That's going to cause insulin resistance. So I think that's where the blood sugar connection comes in is that by getting that deeper, more restorative sleep, you're, it's indirectly now going to enhance your blood sugars because your insulin sensitivity is going to be up. Your cortisol is going to be down and you're just, so, so that's the kind of the connection. Um, personally, that was the biggest change for my life was taping my mouth just because my blood sugars were so much better in the morning and then all the added benefits. But I think it just comes back to the parasympathetic response and then insulin sensitivity being enhanced. Perfect. I appreciate that. One more, one more uh, diabetes question. Then we're going to jump out to, uh, to, to just one last question for you. But um, anxiety during hypoglycemic times, that's not uncommon, right? So if we drop really quick, our blood sugars drop quick and we're caught off guard, whether or not we're using a, a continuous glucose monitor or not, uh, that oftentimes sets off this cascade of events in our body where we start to have this anxiety event. In some cases, not everybody. Have you ever had those issues and then ultimately have you incorporated some, some of your breathing techniques and that's kind of alleviated some of that? I'm trying to see how we might be able to use this as a tool in very specific situations. No, that's a really great question. So yeah, of course, I'm a type 1 diabetic. I still get low, you know, and, and yeah, I still... So I would say it gets back to what you mentioned earlier about how once you start breathing, you start noticing, you know, you were talking about you might notice your diaphragms moving your chest. Now, especially at night, if I wake up low and I'm like, oh man, I, I, like I, I start getting anxious, I immediately say, oh, my blood sugar is low. And like, I know it, like before I even really like rationalize it or before like I feel the, the low symptoms itself, just the anxiety itself. I'm like, I just notice and say, okay, I'm low. I better go, go test and eat some glucose tablets. And that has a huge positive impact on my life because sometimes now I even use it. I'm like, oh, okay, I'm low and I, I eat my glucose and I get back in bed. And rather than like anxiety, I'm like, you know, now I can think it's okay to be thinking about stuff because I know I'm not going to go back to sleep for a little while. So let me just think about things I'm interested in rather than fall back asleep. And um, the other thing I can mention about that is when I wake, if I ever wake up low, um, I always do my, my at least 11 minutes, sometimes 15 minutes first thing in the morning. And when I'm low, it's way harder, right? Because you're in that sympathetic uh, response. And I found that it does help at least even it out a little bit. I'm not going to say I, I flip and I'm the happiest person alive, but it definitely, if I'm like, okay, I'm, you know, let's say I wake up 58 or something and I take my glucose tablets and then I'm like, 
okay, it's time for my breathing. I'm going to do it anyways, even though I'm not going to get the response I would have gotten, I'm probably going to at least get myself to baseline again, <laughs> back to normal. So, so yeah, it, it can be used as a tool. Just don't ignore the low blood sugar, <laughs> you know, just fix that and then do the slow breathing to help with the anxiety. Definitely not. It's interesting because I just had a, a thought about the fact that, you know, when typically when I get low, I'm, I'm really grumpy and, and, uh, those around me don't want to be around me because it's, it's all about me at that point of time. Yeah. Right. <laughs> And it, it, it's, you're right. It's, it, it allows you to actually be more mindful of how you're act, reacting towards the stimuli, whether, whether they're internal or external. And ultimately I, I can, I can't talk for my wife, but I can almost guarantee that, that I'm not as much of a grouch as I used to be when I get low because I'm handling it a lot better because of my awareness of the situation as you described. So yeah, definitely. So you did something pretty incredible. And I, I really want to end on this note because, you know, throughout the years, I've had conversations with some, some, uh, some individuals who've done some incredible things, uh, climbing uh, Mount Everest as a type one, literally rowing across the Atlantic Ocean, people who've run, you know, the Marathon de Sable, the Arctic Challenge, all these amazing things. But you did something pretty incredible. And this is how you got on my radar. Uh, you did a hundred mile ruck uh, not too long ago, but it, it was purely for a, a, um, it was for an, an unselfish reason. It seems like you were trying to raise awareness around something that we just talked about for the past hour. So maybe you can kind of dive into a little bit about the ruck. And I want to, I have a couple of specific questions I want to talk to you about, but why'd you do it? Yeah. Uh, so I found, so it's the health and human performance foundation was the nonprofit organization we were running, uh, raising money for and just raising awareness around the breath. So like we, we talked about, you know, it, it's just not on anyone's radar. There's no endocrinologist prescribing breathing. And so I, I became associated with HHPF. I saw actually, I think it was a post Brian McKenzie put about, uh, you know, he started this foundation and, and actually got started with a woman asking him a question about, well, could breathing help with diabetes? And so I was like, oh, that's interesting that that's how the whole thing kind of got going. And I found her name and then. I sent her a cold email like, hey, you know, I have this website where I just post all these journal reviews. If they're of use to you guys, please use them. I, you know, I want to get this message out. That was kind of it. She, we set up a phone chat and then we become really good friends. And, and I try to help out as much as I can with the organization. And so when I got to meet them and they're living, you know, they're they're embodying their message. They're not just mm -hmm. trying to, you know, they're actually doing the things they, they're talking about. And they, so they have a lot of studies with chronic disease, with first responders, like firefighters, police officers, trying to increase resiliency, increase uh, or decrease stress and anxiety associated with these high, these high stress jobs. And so I was just truly impacted by their mission and that they're living what they're talking about. So just, you know, a lot of times I, I'm just trying to find a way to get this message out. I'm not a good marketer. I'm not a good anything. <laughs> so, but I, I do, I do like physical exercise and, my brother and I w would do these rucks. Um, we had done a few or two different 50 mile rucks, um, for this, this race in, in Jacksonville beach, Florida. And so it just, I kind of said, you know, I, I want to do a hundred. It's just kind of that romantic distance, a hundred miles. And, but I didn't want to do it for no reason. And I was like, what better way to combine everything I've been talking about than to, to prove it, you know, like I, I like, you know, I talk about, oh, we're diabetics, we can do anything, especially with the breath helping, you know, it's so beneficial, but I wanted to just kind of prove that, that I'm not just blowing smoke, I guess, I don't know what the, what the right word is, but I, um, so we set up this idea of, I would do a hundred mile and, and wear the ruck as kind of a symbol of the extra burden that we carry as those with chronic disease, for me specifically type one diabetics, but really anyone. And so it really, uh, was was based on that of let's use the the rock as a symbol and let's try to raise awareness around the breath and at the same time raise money for a great organization who's doing the same thing that's awesome that's beautiful man congratulations on that <laughs> Thanks, yeah. 100 miles yes it, it's this romantic number but it's not romantic when you're in the middle of it no it sucked <laughs> <laughs> how did how did you feel after you finished it was, yeah, when I finished, it was awesome. I mean, it was like the weirdest feeling of simultaneous joy, like kind of sadness, like complete, just like crying and happy it was over. So it was kind of the elation of every emotion you can experience all at once. Uh, and yeah, so it was awesome. 
Yeah, and it, it's not like you were just doing it for yourself, as you said. Although there, it, it definitely seems like it was a, a a wonderful goal for you to achieve. But the fact that you were doing it for this nonprofit, which I've been yeah. following, also is the woman you're talking about. Is that Tanya? Yeah, that's Tanya. Yeah. She's so smart, that lady. Yeah. Um, it's scary, yeah. <laughs> she's like, yeah. I, I encourage everybody who's listening to. I'm going to link it up in the show notes, also. But um, as 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 you were saying, the work that they're supporting through the uh, foundation is pretty remarkable. So I want everybody to understand who they are, um, and if they can, uh, you know, contribute in any way possible. I think with the work that they're doing, especially now with it's a it's a it's a soft spot for me because I'm in the healthcare profession as well, but. The fact that healthcare providers um, are dealing with so much stress right now, and if we have the information and the tools to be able to help them do their job better and then ultimately live their own lives better, uh, whether it's first responders, police officers, or military, kids in school, it doesn't make a difference. This this information really is so important for all of us. So I'll link that up in the show notes. Congratulations on that. That's just a really amazing achievement, and uh, thanks for doing that work. Yeah, thank you. So, um, again, I want to remind everybody, your website is thebreathingdiabetic.com. You want to share your social handles as well? Uh, I'm, I guess just at the breathing diabetic on Instagram. And then I'm also on Facebook, the same thing, but, uh, I, I typically am on Instagram the most. Awesome. So make sure you guys check, check out Nick's information. It's, it's science-based, but he does break it down. So it's really easy to understand and apply in your own world. And I hopefully, that this, uh, I hope that this information was super useful for all of you out there. Nick, is there anything that I forgot to ask you that I really should have asked you? No, I think we covered a lot. Uh, I, I'll make one more plug for HHPF. Um, they are with this whole coronavirus trying to put out a lot of peer reviewed journal scientific articles about breathing and anxiety, just like what you were talking about with first responders, um, and also breathlessness or dyspnea or, or um, breathlessness. And that will be. I don't know when that'll be available, but um, there will be. They'll be posting on Instagram and things like that. So if anyone's interested, they're they're trying to do as much as they can from the science side of, of understanding breathing for resiliency. Really, not so much the virus itself, but resiliency from all the the negative anxiety from it. Awesome, Nick. I really appreciate your time. I'm going to ask you to hold on for a second yeah. after I hit stop for a second. But I want to say thank you very much. And uh, this was so awesome. And I really hope we can continue our conversation. Yeah, I loved it. Thanks a lot. I just want to thank Nick one more time for coming on the show and sharing all those valuable insights. Make sure you check out his website, which is thebreathingdiabetic.com. And while you're at it, make sure you check out the Health and Human Performance Foundation's website. I'll make sure I link that up in the show notes. I'm happy to be back. I'm glad you guys are with me, and I look forward to seeing you again for the next show. Take care, guys. Thank you.